Am I doing the intro? Yep. Yeah. Are you gonna do the uh, the sponsor? No, I'll do it separately. So then I shouldn't do the intro. We're on. Welcome everyone to POV Crypto, the only podcast that both Bitcoiners and Ethereans listen to. I am David Hoffman here with my buddy Christian. Christian, how you doing? Doing good, man. It's been a long day. Uh, it seems like these days have a lot of work, but uh, it's fun to end it on a podcast, hanging out with uh, with Ben, a good person that I met last year at Bitblock Boom, and I'm excited to uh, to hang out with him again there. Uh, ben, how's it going? Welcome to POV Crypto. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I had a long day as well, lots of work, but uh, glad to be here. It's fun talking to you guys so far. Um, so Ben, why don't you introduce yourself and... Uh, Tell our listeners why you're on this podcast. Yeah, so um, well, I'm Ben. I work at Shirtbits. We do uh, like Bitcoin and Lightning stuff. Um, tend to stay away from shit coins. Primarily, uh, what we've been working on lately is discrete log contracts, which are a way to do smart contracts on Bitcoin. And I'm guessing I was brought on here to show that you can do smart contracts on Bitcoin and don't need Ethereum for that. I mean, that's, I wouldn't say it wasn't to show that, but maybe just to educate people about the technology yeah, being exactly. built on Bitcoin. Um, you gave a presentation about this recently. Why don't you kind of tell people or give people like the, the high level view of like what a discrete log contract is and what makes it different than like a Turing com- complete contract on Ethereum? Yeah, so um, I recently did a talk at the Bitcoin VR meetup. And uh, generally what a DLC is, is a, any sort of contract that becomes uh, contingent on an Oracle signature. So um, how we do this in Bitcoin is you make a, con- or a transaction not spendable without having the Oracle signature, and then you use those signatures to then broadcast a transaction. So what this lets us do is Say if you want to have a contract betting, if X event happens, you have an Oracle sign, true or false, if X event happens, and then you use that signature plus some uh, fancy cryptography and uh, like Bitcoin magic and your contract's executed without anyone ever knowing that you actually did a contract. Okay, so this is primarily regards to um, uh, some sort of prediction market uh, use case, right? Yeah, exactly. So you could do anything where you want to predict, you know, is the price of Bitcoin going to be up or down or like election results, what have you, just anything that can be serialized into a something you can sign. Okay, so the, yeah. this uh, piece of uh, this smart contract uh, is specifically related to that. Are there other ways that we can apply this in, in different um, situations, or is it specifically with regards to um, prediction? Um, I mean, you could do like anything. So, say if you wanted to do something where 
uh, I guess prediction is like the best use case for, well, you could do something where like, if you want to build a side chain out of that or something, you know, if you're doing a withdrawal and the withdrawal says like this happens, then that event triggers the DLC that'll cause the like funds to go to the correct person. So it's just any future events get, that's that you, as long as you can have a serialized version of what's going to happen in the future and you can sign it, then you can create a DLC off of that. Okay, so when you say that we don't need to use Ethereum to build smart contracts, you're specifically talking about uh, what you can do with prediction markets, or is there a way to make this more extensible and generalizable? Well, since this, you're just needing to sign a message that something happened, you could do literally any kind of contract. So if you had some Turing complete contract that needs to, that, you know, on execution X event happens, then you can just have the Oracle run that on their own side. And since you're gonna be trusting them anyways for like generally any contract where you need outside data, then it should be okay to trust that they're gonna execute it correctly. And um, DLCs do have punishment mechanisms. So if they do lie, there's some ways to get that back. But uh, otherwise, so if you had like some thing, as long as it goes back into a Bitcoin uh, th denomination, which I don't know if Bitcoin becomes main money, which would be like, that makes sense because you just want money back. So as long as you have a contract that's executing it back into Bitcoin, you could do that. So say like if you had a betting market where, uh, I don't know, you're having a, a contract that's just this like script, it's a turn complete script, but if that executes the true, then the Oracle signs true, if it executes the false, or whatever, and then they sign false or whatever you want. Okay, can you talk about that punishment mechanism or that incentive mechanism to, to not lie? Yeah, yeah, so um, this is, um, in DLCs, you, uh, oracles cannot equivocate. What that means is if a DLC or a DLC oracle signs a message for the same event saying, like saying true, like if, the, if it's a binary event where it's true or false, if the, the oracle signs true for one guy, and false for the other. Um, by doing, by uh, getting both those messages, you can take both uh, messages and steal the private key from that oracle. So then um, they could obviously just use that public key and stake some funds for that. So say they put like 50 Bitcoin under this contract or under this public key. So that means anything, any oracle um, staking like 50 Bitcoin now it's safe to do any contract up to 50 Bitcoin with them because if they're going to cheat you and sign two different messages, they, they'd, uh, there's no incentive to do that unless it's over how much they're staking. Okay, so there's like there's this binary outcome. It's either a one or a zero. And if the Oracle reports both a one and a zero, those two things can be combined to generate the private key for the stake that the Oracle has. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Does that and it doesn't need to be... Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, um, it doesn't need to be binary. It could be like an infinite number of outcomes, but as okay. long as you get two signatures from the same event, you can combine them and you get their private key. Okay, that's kind of cool. And so, sorry, who can get these private keys? Anyone? Anyone that received these? The yeah, anyone attestation? receives. Like, yeah, as long as they see the two signatures. So, um, at Shredbits, we have like a mock DLC Oracle up where you basically like you pay for price data. So if we were lying and we told someone like Bitcoin's 10K and then we told another guy Bitcoin's 5K, if they saw both of those signatures, they could take it and then steal our private key. Okay, so one of the really great things about Ethereum is that all of these contracts are accessible on chain, which allows them to be scalable because anyone from around the world can access the same contracts and, and that um, just makes the scale go up. Like it's easier for yes. a large number of people to all interact with these things. How does that same dynamic uh, play out with, with uh, DLCs? Um, it's actually, I consider it more scalable because most of your contract logic is all just um, adding signatures together. So that's all happening off chain and you can't tell that people are actually doing these contracts because to so say like, It'll just look like a the on-chain footprint is just a two of two multi-sig. So it looks the same as anyone else's, like lightning transaction or coin swap or what have you. But um, and then these also can be executed on lightning. So um, 
that, that will take some time though because we need Chinor. But otherwise, um, you're just doing the same thing. We're taking an Oracle signature and making your Lightning payment contingent on that signature. So um, that way you can do even more things where you can have them instantaneous, not waiting for block times or anything like that. So like the two parties that are involved with the outcome of uh, an event, does, does it have to be two parties or can it be many different parties on both sides that are making some sort of market between, between them two? Yeah, you can do theoretically like an infinite number of parties and, and an infinite number of oracles if you really wanted. So uh, like it's like completely composable where, you know, you could switch it out for any way you want to where, you know, I want like these three oracles with me and my five friends and that doesn't affect you and doesn't change at all for like anyone else if they want to use like their four friends and three other different oracles where we don't need to like deploy a new contract or anything like that it's all just done um and basically how you're computing your signatures beforehand are those all individual transactions that are required to do that um yes and no so um it's a DLC is mainly just two transactions, one where you all put your inputs into a multi-sig and then the uh, winner would uh, get the Oracle signature and then spend the multi-sig to um, whoever wins. Or if you could do like granular payouts out as well. So like if like half you get half the money, then you'd spend a half, you have the signatures for half of that. But um, so, but sorry, what was the question again? Mainly, I, I want to just kind of get into the frictions or lack of frictions between like a allowing many, many people to interact with like one single contract, right? Yeah. So, yeah. It, okay. Yeah. So you're you just need to coordinate that, like, negotiate a funding and a closing transaction. So you could do this through like a coordinator, like how Wasabi coordinates a giant coin join between like a hundred to like people. You could do the same thing with a DLC where you're passing around signatures as well. Or, you know, you could just do a peer to peer, like something like join market where there's no central coordinator, but you're all talking to each other peer to peer. Um, it's really like boundless because at the end of the day, you're just passing signatures around. So it's not much to coordinate. Just, so, I mean, yeah. part of the, it, for the people who aren't uh, reading the ticker, discrete is, uh, is spelled with, uh, like discrete um like uh like keeping something i guess like it, it's spelled uh it's spelled with two e's the private way yeah the private way um not the cryptographic way um so part of the reason why discrete log contracts seem to uh give an advantage or have a, a niche use case is because they do offer some additional privacy um can you talk about that yeah so since um, you are just adding an Oracle signature to your own transaction signature, there's no actual like distinguishable on-chain footprint to this. So like on something like Ethereum, when you like make a transaction to the MakerDAO, it's very obvious that it went to like X address and it's a MakerDAO transaction. Um, but where if you're using something like a DLC, it just looks like you're sending money to a 202 multisig or whatever, an event multi-sig, and then spending it from there. So there's no actual way to know that it was a DLC. And the Oracle can't tell as well, since um, even though you're using their signature, you're just getting a point from them. So they would need to know your public keys as well to get, uh, like, to be able to tell that was their DLC. So as long as you don't give them that, which you shouldn't be, you'd be safe. And even if they did know that, um, you just you're just using their, like, like you're just getting a price or whatever signature from them saying like, so they're signing the message to say like Bitcoin is 10K. They don't know if the contract was, it, like if, you, if you're betting if, is Bitcoin under under over 10K, if you're betting that Bitcoin is like not zero or whatever, is you're just betting, you're just, they just know like that is the signature that you're using. You're muted. Can you talk a little bit more about the oracles in the system? Like it'd be interesting, like, why would someone be an oracle like in what form would the oracle like kind of like appear in terms of like like a business or organization operating it or individual and like compare and contrast that to like the oracles used in in some DeFi contracts yeah so um the 
Oracle, uh, like what they exactly do is just sign messages and give them out. So as well as give pub keys and uh, an R value um, beforehand. So um, at Shirdvitz, we have set up a like a mock DLC Oracle, as I said before. And what we do is we charge like one penny worth of Satoshis for the setup and then one for the um, execution, so our signature. So that way, like we get paid for someone using a DLC and it's like trivially small where as long as you have enough volume, you should be making money and there's virtually no overhead since you're just giving out like 60 bytes. And then, so that, um, that way the Oracle is incentivized to stay honest because it's their business plan. Plus we talked about before where they're staking, they can stake money so they can, um, so you know, you, you should be safe if they're lying. And uh, so for versus where you have something like a DeFi contract from my understanding, you know, that you need like token economics, like incentivizing if the token goes up or down for them to stay honest or um, maybe not stay honest, but you know, do the, that's that's their income stream where if the token loses value, then they could um, be in, like their, uh, I say it, their incentive model, I guess, can change where they don't need to, if they're going for the Ethereum instead of their underlying uh, token, things could change versus with uh, this, you're just getting paid in sats where you don't need to worry about any like float or anything like that. Are you talking about a specific Ethereum application or just as a model? Uh, just as a model, mostly. Um, for, like from my understanding, like MakerDAO, they're incentivized by the, the token like going up or something and then, no. no. Yeah, I haven't looked too much into MakerDAO to be honest, but yeah. You did. I definitely think you could do a little bit more research on the specific oracles in in uh, in DeFi. Maybe David will take a chance to educate you. But on the flip side, uh, like there's no purpose of asking you stuff that you don't know. Um, can you talk a little bit about like the UX of using like discrete like log contracts? Like you kind of mentioned, it's something similar to Wasabi. Maybe some of our listeners don't know what how Wasabi does it. Um, can you kind of describe like what downloading Wasabi Wallet does, running that software on your computer, and how that uh, helps you know kind of organize people to do coin joins, and then how that could potentially uh, you know people could use something similar to that or join market or whatever to uh, organize around these contracts. Yeah, so with Wasabi, um, you would like fund your wallet, so put in like say a Bitcoin, and then you just mark some UTXOs and hit uh, mix. And you know you wait like an hour, and then a round would happen. Um, for like a DLC, you could have a similar thing where say you have like a perpetual. Does Bitcoin move up or down in the next hour? So then everyone would register some coins, like say every hour, and then uh, that then they get a DLC set up. So so you could have like 50 participants, and then on the hour, um, say Bitcoin price has gone up, they'd get the Oracle signature saying Bitcoin price has gone up, and then just one of the participants or even the coordinator could just take the Oracle signature, add it to everyone else's signatures and then DLC is executed. And then, you know, whoever wins and loses gets their funds or lack thereof. Um, but there's even like, that's just one example. You could do anything where you could have like a joint market set up where you're just going on IRC and finding like, you know, who wants to bet if Trump's gonna win the election, let's use uh, Blockstream's Oracle or whoever. And then, uh, you find a buddy, bet a Bitcoin and block it up and then come like November 4th or whatever, you get your signature and add it and then execute. It's, um, I mean, it's really composable. We have a, uh, an, we managed a Bitcoin S wallet and uh, we have a mock uh, DLC wallet going right now. There's some demos on our website if you guys want to check that out later, but um, they're kind of hacky right now since this is very work in progress, but uh. Yeah. So I, I see this becoming like immediately useful for people who are trying to hedge, right? Mainly perhaps like miners as, as the uh, people that need to hedge against Bitcoin price the most. Can you talk about how a miner may use this system? Um, honestly, it might not be the best for that since it has to be denominated back into Bitcoin. So I guess you could be shorting it and get more Bitcoin back, but you're still then again getting Bitcoin. So you kind of get weird things going there, but um, you could definitely use it. I mean, you could be hedging 
like ETH BTC or you know you could I mean you could do this on any chain because then again you're just adding signatures so I mean you could do like ETH Tron on a Bitcoin one and hedge it that way if you think so but yeah I'm sure that doing ETH Tron on Bitcoin would be perfect product market fit oh yeah exactly <laughs> Um, so I guess for these to be useful, like obviously there has to be wallets kind of developed to access or, you know, build TLCs uh, or uh, D, uh, DLCs. Um, you need, you know, to develop a community, there needs to be a, a, a community or a group of oracles that are, you know, signing and providing signatures and, and data like uh, where where is the adoption of this technology right now, and where do you think you need to be to really start getting some traction? Yeah, adoption's basically zero right now because this is super work in progress. Like um, for the specification on like exactly how to coordinate these between peers, we're not even done with like version zero dot one so far, but um, we do have uh, these guys from Atomic Loans. They what they do is like a uh, stable coin backed loans uh, where you back it up with uh, Bitcoin. Um, right now they use like some fancy Ethereum contract with like hash images and HTLCs on Bitcoin to make it atomic. But we're actually working with them uh, somewhat to try to get it so they could use a DLC instead where they're locking it up with uh, like on Ethereum, they'll lock up their or get their uh, collateral and their, their tokens and then that would reveal like a hash free image or basically a signature. And then they could use that to claim or not claim their uh, DLC collateral. So then you're collateralizing a stable coin with Bitcoin on chain without ever having to actually interact. And then like your DLC Oracle is just signing if you get liquidated or not, which um, is really nice because then you're no longer. So what they do now is like an escrow where they need to have like some third party actually sign a transaction, which can get into regulatory problems as well as uh, like mixed incentives where you know, they, someone could coordinate with them and just sign a transaction that for someone else. Um, so this is kind of a random question, but there's a lot of people working to try to quote unquote, get Bitcoin on Ethereum. Is there a potential way to use a discrete log contract to uh, like manage a token on on Ethereum, or is that something that's like kind of a crazy question? Um, theoretically, it could be possible, but I'm not too sure. Uh, like as long, I mean, you could just sign something. Like you could make an ETH uh, DLC where it's just a derivative of the Bitcoin price, but it's just going to be denominated in ETH again. So it'd be like a ETH BTC derivative, which would kind of work, but yeah. You could probably buy insurance on the main Bitcoin chain if a contract breaks. Like if you're sending your Bitcoin over w uh, via Ren and then Ren breaks, maybe maybe you can buy insurance with a, a DLC. Yeah, if you had a uh, an Oracle signing like is Ren broken or did this contract go through? So I mean, Not a bad way to hedge. So I mean, it sounds like there are potentials for this to kind of like bring about some interoperability um stuff like that like do you guys think about that at all at sure bits or like what's the use cases that you guys are focused on um we're focused on mostly like market data stuff right now because we um like before we started really working on this we had a like a where you pay like lightning f for like market data between any like crypto pair or um as well as like nba scores or nfl scores stuff like that but um I mean, theoretically, it could be for anything. So, I mean, it's all like super theoretical, but mostly right now because it is so early and we just started like specking out everything where we haven't really got to the product side yet of it. But um, like I said, the Atomic Loans guys are looking at it to be used so they could do um, in their, atom their uh, collateralized, uh, what's that called? Stable coins. So who's on your team and how do you, how are you guys funded? Um, it's uh, me, Chris Stewart, Nadav Cohen, and Roman Taranchenko. We're all located uh, across the US. We, um, I think we were VC funded. I think we actually got some of the Tim Draper coins from like forever ago, but uh, 
I'm not too sure about that. It's not really my part of the business, I guess. But yeah. What do each of those uh, three other guys do? Uh, we're all devs. So um, like me and the Dov are the main people working on DLCs right now. Um, we have the Bitcoin S library that is just a Scala implementation of Bitcoin. So uh, we like implemented fully DLCs in there as long as like with a wallet and like a node and everything like that. And then um, we also have uh, Chris and Roman. They primarily, uh, they do some work on Bitcoin S's, but they also work on our shared bits API, which is what I talked about earlier with the uh, like crypto market prices and NFL scores and stuff like that, making sure that's all well managed. Cool. Well, uh, I mean, I don't think, I think we, I think you did a pretty good job of explaining DLCs. I don't know how much more we want to like stick to this. Should we pivot this more to like, you know, I guess what's your shtick on the on the crypto space right now, and we'll kind of go from there. What do you mean by shtick? Like, like what you what do you make of all this? Like, what's your deal? Like, when you're when you come into this, like, it's clear that you're you're into Bitcoin, but like, do you even pay attention to other stuff? Like, what's uh what's your what, what's your take? Um, I guess like I mean, when I first got into this, I was like the you know generic like Reddit multi coiner where. You know, every coin's got their say and do whatever you want. But um, I don't know, after spending a lot of time, I think, like, what we got is censorship, resistance, sound money. And that's, like, that's the main prop, like, value prop. And we should try to do what best we can for that. Like, I think Ethereum is, like, interesting, or basically any altcoin can be interesting. But at the end of the day, one money is going to win out. So I think that's our, like, Bitcoin's our best shot at that. So, I don't know, like, I think Ethereum could be cool if it was, like, Bitcoin denominated, so something like Liquid, but, you know, you didn't get into the trade-offs, but, yeah. Okay, so why why do you think, do okay, so do, what does that mean for Ether, the asset? Like, what, is it just, it's just going to get swarmed by BTC, or what's going on? Um, I mean, I, I kind of understand the, like, ETH as, like, quote-unquote oil argument where, you know, because you're just paying for block space for executing a uh, contract, a turn complete contract on this chain that's um, supposedly censorship resistant, which makes sense. But I think something like Liquid just makes more sense because you're then just using money to pay for something instead of, like, a, another asset with a float. Yeah, so you know. that, that's a common like misconception that I see a lot of people make. So Ether isn't what is paid for for block space. Gas is. You pay for gas with Ether. And so like gas is its own currency. And this, this is like uh, John Pfeffer, I think, was like one of the biggest guys that led this thesis where like Ether is going to succumb to the velocity problem because it's just gas. So like you're just going to use as little as it as, as you need to get your transactions in. But that's not what Ether is. Like gas is the velocity token, not Ether. Ether is the low velocity token. And so when you uh, when you when we say like Ether is oil for Ethereum, what is what is technically correct is Ether is the currency that is the only currency that can purchase the oil slash gas for Ethereum. Okay. So I, I mean, knowing that, that just makes it less. I think that makes Ether less useful because then you're just and then there's two floats you have to go through for like, if your money's in Bitcoin, then um, or you dollars. worry about the float. Yeah, or dollars or like whatever right the most now. dominant currency is. You know, you need to worry about the float price from your main currency to Ether and then your float price from Ether to gas, which that's a lot of economic calculation that people don't want to worry about and just makes things more friction. David, I'm kind of ignorant to this too. Like, how is gas price determined? Is that like completely market based? Yeah, completely market based, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then formally protocolized and instantiated in EIP one five five nine. I guess that that changes it, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's always going to be market based. It's just like how how what is that market contained inside of? So so, the, so Bitcoin oh, transaction fees are like market based, but how is that different in ETH? Then? Well, so it's right now it's the same in ETH, um, but there's this EIP to kind of formalize the market itself, and so there's um, EIP one five five nine allows for block space to go up and down based on demand, 
but still follow a targeted size, right? So on, on average, it will follow a targeted size, but for a moment, it can flex up and down. So if a block is really, really big on one for one block, then the next block is going to be really small and hovering, okay. like oscillating around a mean, right? And what this allows us to do is it allows us to bake in the cost of inclusion for a transaction into the protocol. So like when you make a transaction, you see exa the exact number that you need to pay in order to get included. Uh, and um, the only thing that would prevent you from actually getting included is uh, block propagation uh, latency, like in, in case one node uh, mines a block before your transaction, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and so like you aren't given, you aren't given perfect, uh, assurances that your transaction will get in, but you're given pretty strong assurances. I think, I think it's like uh, upwards of like 90%, but it, d it depends cause we haven't, uh, tested this live. Um, but it, it, it turns the cost, the fee to get into a block into something that's akin to like Bitcoin's difficulty adjustment adjustment, where it'll go up and down as congested the blockchain is. Okay. That's interesting. So, but then, I mean, do you just have a float or I guess you give us almost a fixed price then for your fees, at least at any given moment. So, you know, like you can look up like, or do a, is it like an easy calculation then? Or is it like, well, it can just be reported to you. Like you will just be able to see it. You don't have to calculate it. Well, yeah, but like your software is going to have to calculate it. Is it that it's like, or is it like a next block is like one set per byte only or is it like yeah. next block is mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. that's cool right it's so cool so like the whole right. idea is like gas markets are super inefficient right and and bitcoin price uh, fee markets are also super inefficient right like everyone tends to overpay by a lot and so this is one uh, potential solution to just like wipe that clean and be like well we're fixing this we're fixing this yeah I mean, but does that, I mean, there could be, well, there problems arise if you're getting full blocks and a full mempool. So it, it, it targets. Like there's trying to get be a little bit out of my head right? what I know, but it targets 50% full blocks. So you can get a full block, but if it's, if you do get a full block, like prices go up, price for inclusions goes up by a lot. And so that next block is probably not going to be full. Okay. But you, I mean, you kind of get like a DOS vector there, though, where, you know, you're going to pay a bunch of money, but I can make a whole bunch of full blocks for the next, like, week. And yeah, now everyone has if you want to burn a bunch of money. Yeah, but I mean, now, but th that throws off the average for your, the next few, like, while as well. And I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it returns to a mean really, really fast. And so like that, the same, the same, like the whole reason why there's fees, right. Is to pre prevent a DOS and that it doesn't go away. Like the, the, yeah. the fee burn, like sure. You can prevent a DOS well, so long as you have the capital to burn. Well, if you're a miner though, then fees aren't as big as a problem. Yes, this is true, but I don't think that changes the dynamics from how it is today. Well, is the new max fee like block size larger than before? Uh, it'll probably flex up and down. Also, what's important to know is that the fee doesn't go to the miner; it gets burned instead. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a big difference. But yeah, but this is all changing then. Come proof of stake, though, right? Or no, this will get included in proof of stake too. Okay. Oh. It just goes, it won't go to the validator instead of the miner. Oh, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. This does create a weird effect, though, where there's, instead of, like, you paying fees to miners, it's you pay fees to burn, or you burn fees, kind of like gas or whatever you want to call it, and then uh, there's going to be printing on the other side with block, you know, I guess, you know, block reward to mm -hmm. uh, to pay out the validators to at least keep, keep the system going, which is yeah. very different than Bitcoin. Does um does the block reward depend on fees or is it so could you like if there's a bunch of zero fee blocks does that make like inflation go higher? No, so is issuance always stays the same. There is a tiny little tip that goes on. We keep on bringing on new things into this. There's a so base <laughs> fee is what is burned, and that we do, we are projecting that's like above ninety five percent, probably even more of the bulk of what is paid to get included. But then you can also pay a little tip. 
to the validators to ensure that if in the event that we do hit that max block size, that you are included and others that didn't pay the tip aren't. Yeah, so now you have then a... You're muted, Christian. Go for it, ben. You have like a, a changing inflation schedule though, which I mean, that just causes all sorts of problems as well. Where No, 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 the, the issuance for block rewards always stays the same. The, the issuance yeah, for block rewards doesn't change for because of EIP-1559. The supply is changing though, because like sometimes yeah. you're burning a lot of fees, sometimes you're yep. not. So yep. that's true. Your inflation schedule is different, which mm -hmm. that's just another problem there. Where no, you well, yeah, but also it, it introduces speculate. It, first off, it introduces exposure to the growth of the Ethereum economy. So as Ethereum the Ethereum economy grows, EIP one five five nine links the value of Ether to the size and volume of the Ethereum economy. So sure, like the the asset price isn't ever the asset supply isn't ever guaranteed to be one single thing. Like that's a Bitcoiner value, not an Ethereum value. What is uh, linked here is that like if there's a ton of fees, like Ether burn can overtake Ether issuance, and we actually get a a, a deflationary a deflationary asset rather than just a disinflationary asset. Yeah, but I mean, like being inflationary, deflationary is nice. Like being like you know bitcoin fixed supply but it's also like one of the most important things just having like a set schedule where you know you can actually do economic calculation what the supply will be in the next year five years whatever so yeah i i that, that's definitely the, the bitcoin your take right um and i'm glad that bitcoin is around to offer that product and service to us i'm also interested in an, in an asset that appreciates in correlate to the size of the economy that it runs I mean, but that's fair. Uh, well, I mean, I would, I would say that that if Bitcoin becomes money, then it also does that. So, mm -hmm. and um, if it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, I mean that's every asset, really. They they offer different things, but what Bit, but what Bitcoin offers that is completely unique is just fixed supply asset, right? Whereas Ether yeah. is offering something different. Um, so, like David said, I appreciate both things that are happening, but um, in terms of like if we're betting on what's going to be money, I, I, my bet is on the fixed supply asset. You know, other people can bet on a lot of different yeah. things. I kind of wish yeah. like this whole space stopped talking about, is this going to be money or not? I think, I think the whole, in, the whole thing about crypto is it like redefines money into something else. And so like, I think money is like an, actually an old model um, for under, understanding value in the world. There's just going to be value and that's, going to be it and that value can be used as money well i mean it's just money is an asset that's like the most saleable good so mm -hmm. you know, i like i i think every bitcoin believes that like bitcoin has the best properties become the best money and like there's no way you can stop that and you know if, if ether wants to go and try to compete with that it's going to lose but if you like, I mean, it, I think the oil argument makes more sense where, you know, you can, you know, it's another like execution thing where you're burning it to think like uh, execute a contract. But I mean, if you're going for money, you're just going to lose it. Like you can't be like a fixed supply sound asset. Sure. Like maybe going for money, you will lose with money. But uh, I mean, why are we really all here? We're all here for market cap. And so, you know, mar uh, super high market cap doesn't, uh, is only slightly relevant to money. I mean, I mean, Chris, you're muted, Christian. Christian, you're muted. Yeah. I keep doing that. Uh, money is going to have a huge market cap if, especially sure. if it's global money. Yeah. But okay. So, sure. I mean, we're kind of, we're kind of going in circles here though. Um, ultimately like there are different experiments going on um it's interesting to see dlcs it's interesting to see that they're relatively composable um you know if uh if there's a lot of adoption around the technology that's when it's actually going to get interesting i think at least what ethereum has going for it is that you know whatever flavored smart contracts are whatever flavored oracles are at least they're being used um so that's very interesting to, to uh to watch and kind of see that happening um but you know, ultimately, you know, when it comes to what's going to be global money, I think all of us agree that it converges on few things. Um, I think it's going to be one thing, especially with the, the lack of friction that the Internet creates. Um, ben, thanks for coming on. Uh, this was a fun show. 
uh, we definitely do- dove into things and hashed things out, which uh, you know we claim to do here on POV Crypto. So thanks for coming on and uh, and giving us some education and and taking some education back. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, Ben. All right. You guys can find the show at POV Crypto Pod. You can find me at CK underscore Snarks. Um, ben, where can people find you before we go to David and he closes it out? <laughs> um, find me like at Ben the Carmen on Twitter. Or um, if you, we have a bunch of blog posts about DLCs and other Bitcoin things on uh, shirtbits.com slash blog if you want to know more. Ben, thanks for coming on. You can find me at Trustless Date, both on Twitter and on Bankless. Christian, did you do the podcast? Should I do the podcast? No, yeah, I mean, I rate remember. five-star reviews, guys. You got, yeah, five-star go. reviews. Follow the podcast. <laughs> Peace. Thanks, everyone.